Hello and welcome to another episode of the Expert CPG Commerce Podcast. My name is Ryan Flynn, the founder and CEO of Expert CPG Commerce, where we help food, beverage, and CPG brands reach more customers on Amazon and beyond. And today I'm super excited to welcome to the show Jeff Clapper from Eighth and Walton. They are a firm based in Bentonville, Arkansas. And as you can probably guess, based on the location, they have everything to do with Walmart. So they actually help small, medium, large brands, the huge brands you even know today that you have in your house right now, they help them with everything related to Walmart, both .com and particularly in store. Because, you know, as Jeff and I talk about, Walmart can definitely be a black box kind of ecosystem. A lot of metrics they pay attention to, a lot of high performance targets you have to hit with Walmart. And, and Jeff and I really delve into that, what those are, the thinking behind that, and everything the brand should really know when it comes to dealing with Walmart, whether it's first time or you're, you've been in Walmart, and you're really looking to optimize your presence there and, and sell more through that channel. Now, before we jump over to Jeff, if you're a brand and you're maybe in the food beverage CPG space or and you're selling on Amazon and you're doing well, but you're not doing maybe everything you think you could be, then we would love to talk to you. We would love to help you and show you what you could do on Amazon, what your full potential is on Amazon. So a lot of our clients we've helped over the years, you know, they're growing brands. They maybe have an internal resource working on Amazon in-house or they're working with maybe another agency and they're not just realizing the full potential. They're kind of feeling it in the back of their mind. They're like, you know, I think we could be doing more. And again, we would love to show you that. We would love to present to you an audit, which is one thing we do for all of our potential clients where essentially, you know, we look at your Amazon account, both on the back end and under the hood, things like programs, operations, advertising, and obviously some of the back end things as well, but also things that every customer can see as well. We take an in-depth look and present that to you in an audit format and show you what you could be doing on Amazon. So if you have that doubt in your mind and you're not sure if you're doing everything you could on Amazon or you know you could be doing more, we'd love to talk to you. So go to expertcpg dot com slash audit and you fill in some information there and we'll get back to you on whether or not you qualify for the free audit we do have a team that's devoted to this and, and is doing these audits and you know we do have limited bandwidth so you know we can't serve everybody with a free audit we'd love to but we want to make sure we provide the best quality for those who are looking for an audit so again go to expertcpg.com slash audit for your free audit and we would love to have a chat with you and see how we can potentially help you now Let's jump in the episode with Jeff Clapper from Nathan Walton. All right, my guest today on the Expert CPG Commerce Podcast is Jeff Clapper from Nathan Walton. Jeff, thanks for joining the show. Thanks for having me. Great, great to be here, Ron. Awesome. Well, tell us a little bit about uh, Nathan Walton. Uh, you know what you guys do, and, and kind of you know who, what, what kind of customers you guys serve. Sure. Yeah, we uh, Ethan Walton's been in uh, business almost twenty years, providing education and guidance to Walmart suppliers. Um, so that's all the product companies that have anything on the shelves in the Walmart stores or on Walmart.com. And we've been teaching thousands and thousands of people every year for um, yeah for all that time. And those are you know the product companies that are well established. You know uh, global brands. You you'd know well the the P&Gs and uh, Coca-Colas and those kinds of companies that have established teams um, that want to be best in class and collaborative building building a great business with Walmart. That's where we started off is, is teaching the team members of those large organizations. And then uh, over the years recognized that uh, small and medium businesses, whether training was the right solution, one, two, three day classes on sales and analytics and supply chain and accounting, uh, we're teaching those teams. And then also in many cases now, we we really serve more as uh, consultative guides to those companies in uh, in terms of helping them understand uh, how to maximize their sales and profitability and the overall opportunity that they have with Walmart. And again, that can be on all the same kinds of facets. So sales strategy, communication with your buyer, uh, replenishment supply chain, production planning, uh, operations, accounting—really, all of the things that a that a best in class Walmart supplier needs to know. Um, we can either teach teams in a in a classroom setting, uh, or we work with suppliers over a period of time, really getting their team well informed and up to speed on those best practices. Yeah, I mean that's a ton. I mean, like it's funny when you say all that, and you know, I've chatted before about a Walmart and different things, right? But it's—I don't think the obviously the, I don't think the general public has an idea, but even. 
brands that are getting into retail. Um, obviously, Walmart is like the 800 pound gorilla, right? And it's kind of like I tell people the same thing with Amazon. It's like it's they're wearing the highway. Like you've got to follow their their stuff, right? <laughs> because um, if you think about the scale of these companies, right, whether it's Amazon, Walmart, whoever, they need to have the structured systems and these ways to do things, ways to communicate, ways to get product in and these certain SLAs, things you have to meet. And again, I don't think maybe even people in the in the space understand all the all the complexity can go into it, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, it's it's funny. I just had a conversation a couple of weeks ago. There's a client we started talking with about a year ago. They were going to start shipping to Walmart a couple months past when we started talking. You know, early spring of 23. And as we've just you know we're nearing the end of the year of working with them, and he said. I think for a minute we thought we could do this on our own. We didn't think there was going to be that much complexity or demand of knowledge and expertise and how we were going to execute this. And I am I was so wrong and I'm so glad that we got to work with you guys. So <laughs> um, it could have been it could have been disastrous and instead they're going to have a really great uh, launch. They've had a great launch and they're going to have a great career with Walmart. So exactly to your point, I mean, it, it's a complex and demanding account. And, you know, Walmart is ever changing. I think that's that's one of the things I always like to credit them on. They're dynamic. They don't rest on their success, and so they are always evolving and improving. And as a, as a result, of course, that creates change in, in expectations and requirements and practices for everyone around the business, namely, of course, in this case, the supplier. So not only is it complicated, like you said, but it's, it's always going to be changing and for the better for the most part. So um, that's, that, that creates a really good, meaningful, neat place for us to, to provide support and value. Yeah, and when would a company like you know, come to Ethan Walton, like when, when would they, you know, engage with you guys, reach out to you guys in the journey of their life cycle? You know, there are, there are a couple of places where we often start talking, probably two or three that I'd mentioned just in a, in a high level conversation. One is, um, you know, maybe a VP of sales or a president who just got a yes from a buyer. they said, you know, we want to take you in a couple hundred stores, maybe a couple thousand stores. And they're thinking, okay, great. We celebrated for five minutes and now we've got to figure out how we're actually going to do this. And so, we, we come in and work with them on, you know, how are you going to set up your supply chain? How are you going to set up your items? Some of the initial work that happens from when you got the yes to when you start shipping. And then there's a lot of work that happens week to week as an actual supplier. And so, you know, how are you, how are you forecasting orders and planning your production? And, and if you're, you know, bringing product from uh, outside the U.S., how are you planning around all of that? And then how are you communicating what's working with Walmart? How are you communicating challenges? Uh, maybe there are opportunities. You could be performing better where you have distribution. If you make adjustments to the forecast, how do you analyze and share that back to Walmart? So anyway, we're oftentimes starting with a, a sales lead who's got the relationship going, and we're here to provide a lot of guidance and support behind the scenes for that person and their team uh, across their organization. Um, in other cases, you know, we work with suppliers that are have been in Walmart for decades. Maybe they're already doing up to $100 million a year with Walmart, and it's it, oftentimes, again, it's a VP of sales. But they don't have anyone dedicated to Walmart. So it's not the business is not necessarily to a size where they're going to have two, three, or, or maybe even dozens of people working on Walmart. But they have a warehouse manager. They have a production manager. They have all these people. And they're trying to figure out, again, how do we make the most of this opportunity? And, and maybe they're stuck. Uh, you know, Walmart has certain programs, compliance programs that can result in, they can result in growth in sales, but they can also result in penalties and, and uh, costly penalties to a business. So sometimes that conversation begins with, Hey, we're getting a well, you know five figure a month OTIF penalties from Walmart right now. How do we fix that? Or SQEP is another program they've launched a little bit more recently. What is this about? How do we understand it? How can we fight it? You know, th those kinds of questions will come up even with established suppliers. And so that's another place we might start is we're doing you know five to a hundred million dollars a year with Walmart. We don't have the internal expertise on Walmart. Can you help us figure this out? So. That's a fairly common uh, common spot too, is established and looking for a guide and a resource to help them really understand best practices with Walmart. Obviously, Wal when we talk Walmart, right? And we, we talk about there's obviously Walmart in store, the traditional, right? But then there's obviously the e-com side, right? Which we'll definitely can delve into a little bit, but particularly in store, right? Because that's, um, I think, kind of the, the black box that people think of or, or don't know as much about than maybe the marketplace platform or something like that. You know, what should brands really know when when dealing with Walmart, when, when getting in the store? Like, yeah. like what, what are the, the mindset they should have or the caveats, the pitfalls they should watch out for? Sure. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's a great question. And and I know a lot of uh, your, you know, your business background and probably a lot of the brands that you connect with uh, so well are maybe starting more with an e-commerce or marketplace, a 3P sort of approach and a lot of success there. 
Um, and, and in contrast, when you start talking about shipping into Walmart, um, you know, you're going to get, you're not shipping to, you know, a couple of, uh, fulfillment centers. You're shipping to maybe dozens of DCs, large quantities on a weekly basis. And then of course they're shipping out to stores from there. So that that's a different level of complexity in that regard. And then I think overall strategically, probably one of the big differences is it's not a week to week, like, Hey, we started off, uh, filling, you know, we sold, we sent them five units and then we sent them 20 and then we sent them a hundred. This is like right out of the gate. We're getting thousands of units shipped out every week, you know, something maybe less than that after your initial fill. But you have about, you have about three months before Walmart's really going to start looking at that data and saying, okay, is this working in the space we've allocated or not? Because you're always fighting for that space on a very finite shelf. It's not an endless shelf, of course. And so I think some of the, the metaphors I've heard in, and, you know, maybe you've, we've talked about is, um, it is not uh, it is not a baseball game where you're guaranteed nine in, nine innings and this game is going to go until it plays out and we have we have some uh, understanding. I mean, basically every six to twelve months, Walmart is going to be reevaluating your place on the shelf and uh, you know and if it's performing great and if it's not, you're going to have to move on. And that can have to do with you know how it's selling based on consumer demand, and it can also have have to do with how well are you actually filling orders. If there is a gap on the shelf because yeah. you're unable to fill the orders that they're placing that's not going to be a lasting issue. You, you get a little bit of a grace period as a new supplier, but understandably, of course, they've got, you know, they've got to make the most of that space. They'll work with you, but only up to a point. So you've got to be, you've got to come in strong from the start and make the most of it and, and be ready to continue to deliver. Yeah. And I'm sure nothing frustrates either a store manager, a buyer, or anybody up the chain, you know, up and down the chain more than seeing an empty spot on the shelf, right? Where there's uh, where, where there could be something else they could put there or have more of the existing product, right? For sure. Uh, there in the store. And you talked about too before, like there's all these different initiatives that Walmart rolls out, right? Just like any, all, all these different retails, but I mean, Walmart in particular, like what about those initiatives that kind of brands need to be aware of, especially if they're entering, you know, Walmart in store for the first time? If you really think about Walmart as, um, as a distributor and they are trying to maximize the flow of their product from the supplier's warehouse all the way through to the end consumer. And so a lot of the, the programs and the initiatives that you're referring to have to do with uh, the consistency of your operation and, and your delivery to Walmart. So uh, you know, there's a, a few acronyms that come into play here. One I mentioned is OTIF, on time in full. It sounds so simple when you say, hey, we want you to send us everything we ordered by the date we asked <laughs> for it. Like, oh, okay, great. Um, yep. But it's a, they have a high bar. Um, and the goal there is to maximize, as you just said, the space that they're allocating on the shelf. If you aren't filling orders, that's difficult. If you're not delivering when they expect you to, that's difficult, of course. So that's in the in the spirit of maximizing the space that you have at the shelf through consistent delivery. Um, another big one in the last couple of years is SQEP, the Supplier Quality Excellence Program. And these are all standards that they have implemented and then continued to develop and, and sort of, again, kind of raise the bar over time in the name of streamlining and automating their supply chain as much as possible. And so it has to do with the, you know, how many sides do you put a barcode on your, on your case and what kind of ink is mm -hmm. in the label and what's the quality of your pallets coming in and things that, you know, you might never think about again, particularly if you're the VP of sales or the president of the company and you've got a broad uh, responsibility or your focus is on the relationship, but it's not necessarily on the product and how it's flowing through the system. Uh, but understanding those things, like, you, you know, kind of coming back to your question, understanding Walmart's expectations for that product flow is really critical to your long-term success. No one really knows all the little intricacies or the all little things that could come up, right, until they do sometimes, sure. right? Well, so, and, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, as the, as the you know, the, no. the shopper in the store, you're just like, wow, this, um, you know, my my <laughs> milk just shows up here and, and it doesn't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no, you, you, there's a whole other, you know, machine, right? Uh -huh. How the sausage is made, so to speak, right? Uh -huh. but, yeah, it's it's That's it's fascinating, cool. especially the, when you think about all the stores, all the DCs, Walmart has to have. We've talked about a little about, you know, the, getting into stores, right? Maybe getting that initial, maybe a, a brand entering Walmart for the first time, getting that yes, like you said, you know, um, you know, doing a quick celebration, but then realizing, okay, we've got to, we've got to get in, we've got to do this right. Uh, and and number of stores, is there any rhyme or reason to that? I mean, does it, it just depend on the item, the market, the uh, the demographics that item may serve. I mean, does, I'm sure there's no like formula that, that you know or that you know Walmart provides. But um, because in, it's kind of fault that question, it could be a number of different DCs as well. That doesn't just reflect the number of stores you're in, correct? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, and and there's there's a lot of interesting ways to 
to kind of take on that question. Um, you know, roughly speaking, one DC will ship to about a uh, hundred stores. And so, um, you know, when you're talking about uh, being in, let's just say 4,200 stores, you, you might be shipping to about 42 ship points per week. But then there, there can be some inefficiency that happens there too. If a buyer, you know, depending on how it's analyzed by the buyer or the category manager, they might say, here are stores that match demographically where we think this product will sell best. And as a result, you may end up shipping to, uh, you know, uh, a DC here that is going to ship on to five stores and a DC here that's going to ship on to 10 stores. Um, and, you know, you could still end up shipping to 42 DCs but only be in, let's say, 600 stores or 800 stores. And so there can be inefficiency in that. And that can also come back around to be an opportunity with Walmart where you might say, hey, we're shipping to 20 DCs and we're only in half the stores that they serve. So could we look at expanding so that all of those DCs are shipping to all of the stores that they serve? You know, that Walmart's already allocating labor and space in those DCs. If you're if you're not cross dock, they're already allocating space to you. So let's maximize that opportunity. But anyway, yeah, I mean, in terms of what you can expect, it can really run the gamut. I would say the one thing I'd say to a new supplier on that front is uh, just be upfront about your capacity to produce with Walmart. Because again, back to your, your watch out earlier, it's a bad scenario if you come back after a month or two and say, we just don't have the capacity to fill. We got all excited when you offered us 4,000 stores, but we could probably only really handle 500 at least today, you're going to be in a much better position long term if you just own that on the front side and say, we can really, really do well filling orders for 500 stores today, and we'd love to work our way up to that 4,000 stores. So yeah, the communication on the front side is really how you're going to build trust. Yeah. And that, not a situation where you want to fake it till you make it, right? You want to you want to lead with, <laughs> start slow, right? That's right. <laughs> um, you know, and the, the work you guys have done with Aiden Walton, is there, is there a maybe a success story or uh, a, a client you worked that comes to mind that was like, you know, a great, you know, a great fit for what you guys do and a great fit for Walmart as well. And a great fit for the brand. It's a, kind of one of those win, win, win where, um, you know, obviously the brand wins a lot as well in terms of increasing their presence and, and their sales. Yeah. You know, we are, I, I'm glad you said the, 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 you know, what you just did about win, win, win. That is always what we're looking for is uh, solutions that are going to produce great outcomes for the supplier and Walmart. And, and as a result, of course, that's going to reflect well on our brand and, and what we do. So a lot of those have to do with collaborative planning. Um, you know, an example there could be, we just had this happen with a, a company we've helped launch. We, we started working with them many years on the U S business. And, um, now they, in the last maybe six months, they've been uh, growing into Walmart Canada stores. Um, and in the, uh, and in their, in their presence in Canada, which is relatively new, uh, there were some situations where the Walmart forecast, the order forecast was not, was, was kind of level. And we knew that the, that this particular item had a really strong velocity in the U S stores. And so basically it was kind of throttling what they were selling where they already had distribution, uh, just, you know, to, to give it, to give it a more simple, uh, s- to simplify the example, maybe they were carrying five units on hand in these stores and we were expecting them to be able to sell 20 a week. And they were selling out of those five by Tuesday every week. And the forecast wasn't saying we should order six or eight or 10. Um, And so every week we just saw the ceiling was five because that's all that was on hand. Um, And so we were able to present an analysis of all the stores where we really could be expecting much higher velocities. And the, and the, uh, their counterpart inside of Walmart said, yes, let's make a manual uh, increase here based on this insight. And now their sales have grown significantly since Walmart started ordering more basically with that override of the forecast. So we're, we're always looking for those strategies and the analysis that will produce uh, growth where we can. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great story, right? It's always fun to have those those wins as well, where people just don't know the background of it. Uh, and uh, you know, again, people always think you can either think you can manually override things, and you can't, or sometimes you can if you present the right data, right? In those scenarios, you're not really asking for an, uh, another level of risk, or you're not asking the buyer to uh, to take on more items or more stores, you're growing where they've already given you distribution just by maximizing the supply chain and its capabilities. So um, again, that's a win for Walmart. Uh, this is just to look for those kinds of insights. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, is that kind of what a buyer or, you know, they look at in terms of performance? Is it kind of like the, that, that revenue on the shelf space, like that, that literal, you know, sales or, or profit per, per cubic, you know, and short whatever? on the shelf and is it sell through? Are those kind of the two of the big metrics they, they look for they're, they're maybe constrained by as well? 
Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. They're always looking at the whole category. And so, you know, again, a, a great supplier is going to help them assess the whole category and not just what's in it for them with their, you know, one, two, five, however many items. Um, but how is this going to fit in the category? What is this going to, because in most cases, you're going to take the place of another product. So how is this going to elevate the, the, the dollar production of this category for the buyer and what need is it going to fill in your assortment? How is it going to address a need or a gap or raise the bar of the category? Other factors, I think you kind of touched on one of them is just what's the profitability? What's the margin really? Uh, the gross, the, there's a, a GMROI is the gross margin return on inventory. And so, um, and so Walmart's looking at, you know, our, if we can, this is another win for us recently. If we can reduce the inventory and maintain our sales, this is a more profitable item for us. And so finding ways to do that. But yeah, there, there are several key metrics and, and you just named a couple of the big ones. Yeah. So let's shift a little bit to talking about, you know, Walmart, the marketplace, right? The the third party uh, marketplace that Walmart has on walmart.com. And obviously uh, Walmart, you know, wants to compete with Amazon and, and they've made a you know, they, they started, I mean, I don't know when the 3P Marketplace launched. It was probably, gosh, five, seven years ago. I don't, maybe it was shorter than that, longer than that. I can't remember. I know they've been a bigger push in the more recent years of, of getting brands on there and onboarded. Um, but obviously, it's it's a it's a seller marketplace. It's a it's a 3P relationship where you're selling kind of through walmart.com and they're taking a commission and you're fulfilling the orders. But and the, uh, the, obviously, the net kind of is coming to you after the fees and such. How does that play into like obviously you know getting into store potentially or just have the visibility on walmart.com or and do you see that as a a big growth area in general for Walmart and for brands and in, in, in the future here? Yeah, I mean Walmart brought merged basically their dot com and and brick and mortar buying teams a couple of years back and so really now address the entire uh, business as an omni opportunity and exactly like you said now uh, that has enabled a lot of suppliers to get a start on the shelf in the stores uh, because of uh, solid production and, and results on .com. It, it gives buyers also an opportunity to say, hey, what you're doing looks neat, it's intriguing. Um, get, your, get your items set up on Marketplace. Let's see how they produce, how they perform. And then let's come back around and look at it for the stores uh, once we've got some more data there. So that is a really key starting point for a lot of suppliers now. It gives buyers Instead of just saying, no, I'm not going to put you on the shelf, it kind of gives you a new lower gear rather than going from, you know, neutral to fourth gear. Now you've got first, second, third gear maybe before you get there. I'm, I'm kind of making that up, but I think that um, I think that is definitely the play we've seen. And, and so more and more suppliers have that. Um, in fact, I was on a call just earlier today and, uh, and, and it was uh, someone responsible for e-commerce across several business divisions within a large company. And we were talking about some of those divisions have a brick and mortar sales lead. Some of them don't, but the work that this person will be doing on e-commerce will likely drive brick and mortar opportunity for the leaders in brick and mortar of those divisions. And so it's, you know, there is a, a murkiness that comes from that when you take that on yeah. the supplier side, of course, but he had a good, he had a good uh, outlook on it. So that was neat. Yeah. Well, no, you mentioned Omnichannel on the Walmart side. It's all, like you said, it's, you're just referring to the story, right? It's the same thing on the supply supplier side, right? Like it's because it's like all, all these things start, you know, going into each other, uh, whether it be someone, you know, hears about your brand on Instagram and they find you on Amazon, they find you the shelf of Walmart or wherever it is, right? You've got to kind of have all those things in mind. So there's a lot of balls in the air, definitely when it comes to being a brand and uh, things you got to watch for. So in terms of, you know, we talked about like you know, marketplace, obviously didn't store, but like, you know, I know Walmart just like, you know, I, I, all that to always equate with Amazon, but like Amazon's always going with new initiatives, new programs. I know Walmart does as well. What are some things that are maybe coming out, just come out or are coming on the, on the horizon here that maybe brands who are in Walmart or maybe, you know, talking to Walmart now or looking to get to Walmart in the next year or so kind of need to be aware of or need to have on the radar? Yeah, one of them I, I mentioned uh, earlier is, is certainly the, the continued push to automate their supply chain wherever they can. Uh, that just streamlines the, you know, the consistency, the flow, the velocity of products through the supply chain. Um, that's good for everybody. And it comes with expectations that, we, that we've talked about. Another sort of the, probably one of the most top level bullet points in the Walmart space right now is a rollout of a program called Luminate. Um, companies that have been with Walmart for years uh, are probably already familiar with. Luminate is going to take the place of one of the key components of a system called Retail Link. 
uh, Retail Inc. is Walmart's proprietary platform for reporting and analytics to suppliers. So within Retail Inc., there's something called DSS, decision, pardon me, decision support, and that will actually be sunset. So decision support has been out for decades. Suppliers have relied on that to analyze their business with Walmart to to know, you know, what are the what or, orders should we be expecting, and what are we, you know, all, all kinds of aspects of the business. What are our sales, marketplace, all kinds of information. Suppliers have turned to DSS within Retail Link uh, for many decades, and that will go away in a few months. It will be replaced by a system. So that's a, that's actually really really big news for the whole Walmart vendor community right now. Um, it will be replaced by a system called Luminate. Um, which is available now. And there are kind of two levels of, of, of service with Luminate. There's a free basic platform and there is a uh, charter platform, which costs money uh, proportionate to the dollar volume you do with Walmart. Um, and uh, and there's, a, there's a, a bunch of additional information you get as a charter subscriber. And then the basic version uh, from everything we're seeing right now will continue to allow suppliers to manage their business day to day, which is great news. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's probably the big, big bullet point out there right now. Yeah. I mean, alphabet soup and like, just, you know, <laughs> staying ahead, the only, the, I mean, the, I talked about the, you know, the phrase, the, the, the saying, the only constant is, is change, right? Constant change. You just gotta be ready to roll with these punches. And again, you know, it's, it's another, use another, uh, you know, analogy or another phrase is what I heard years ago was, you know, it's the golden rule. Those with the gold make the rules. And if this is Walmart's, you know, new play and, or this is AM, whoever it is, right. It's like, You've got to go buy it, right? There's no, there's no holding on to the old stuff. So, um, that's that's fascinating to know about. That. I'm sure it's a big thing. Yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, you know, I think one of the big things as you're you're kind of referencing Amazon and Walmart and how they how they mix out. You know, of course, Amazon has AWS uh, technology business effectively, and and then they also have their retail business. And Walmart primarily is just the retail business, and so they're they're trying to remain competitive and innovative, and they're saying, hey, how how do we compete with a company that is both tech and retail, we need to open up a new model and a new channel. Um, and so that's the Luminate is one of several initiatives that are really designed to uh, be entrepreneurial and say, look at the entire base of assets. We have screens in the stores and trucks all over the road and stores everywhere. All of these assets, how can we leverage them to open up new business models? They're doing last mile delivery with Home Depot as a pilot right now. That's a new business that they're trying to invent out of the, the assets that they already have in place. Again, Luminate is one of those initiatives. It's to say, we have all this data. How can we sell that and monetize that in some way? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think they're, they're again, to their credit, uh, being entrepreneurial and, and uh, dynamic and trying to continue to invent and reinvent themselves in, in new and meaningful ways. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, yeah. And for sure, I think, and I, you know, again, to compare and contrast the two of Amazon and Walmart, but like, obviously, Walmart, uh, I think you just mentioned Amazon makes a lot of their money from AWS, but a big growth factor in their in the revenue which you've broken out in the last what six, 12, 18 months is now advertising, right? And how much money and how the the growth of that. So I'm sure that's the area Walmart's looking at, especially on the on the main marketplace side, which you can comment on. And then also, I don't know if you want to talk about you know, Walmart fulfillment services, which um, you know kind of is not an unknown thing, but it's it's kind of you know they're they're answered FBA in a way potentially, uh, and and getting having Walmart fulfill. Those items, and when we've compared for clients, it, it typically actually is cheaper to, to fulfill, um, you know, to, to WFS than doing like multi-channel fulfillment from Amazon or something, even FBA fee sometimes. So, um, yeah, do you any any thoughts on those, the advertising or the, the WFS stuff? You you know you you, you kind of uh, did a did a better job covering the points than I did actually. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. Um, yeah, but the Walmart Connect and advertising on Walmart again is the, is that opportunity to say what assets do we have? We're we're having all these page views. You know, how many millions of page views every day? Uh, what can we what can we make out of that business opportunity? And so, yes, selling advertising on Walmart, uh, just like with Amazon, is is a great one. Um, and then the the fulfillment services is, an, is another one. And so, in fact, there's kind of a, a loop there. I think that you could start to see where buyers are saying, "Hey, before we try you on the shelf, let's see you on marketplace." By the way. Um, we can help you fulfill those orders through WFS. So it's kind of an, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, and you know the the, the Walmart advertising, um, I think they have they, they have uh, because of the proximity of stores to consumers everywhere. I think there's going to be a really interesting you know sort of drive the the pickup today and um, all of the uh, all of the distribution options for consumers are very different on Walmart than they are on Amazon. 
when you think about all of America, not just, uh, you know, you know, kind of not just key areas. And so, um, I think advertising on Walmart will, will be a, a big growth area for the company. You know, as someone who lives in, uh, you know, more, more of a rural area that's, that's obviously has a Walmart in very close proximity, even doing like the groceries on Walmart and just the search now on the app. I mean, it's, it's interesting how it's, you know, you can obviously select in store, but if you're searching for a particular product to come to a niche product and it don't have, they don't have it in store, it can still get to you like the next day <laughs> from a DC or somewhere else, which is really interesting for the, you know, the customer standpoint where it's like, okay, I can maybe order my staple groceries, like my, um, you know, non-perishable goods from Walmart, right? The kids snacks for school and everything else. But then also I want these, this niche, uh, supplement or this niche drink or whatever it is. Right. And then all of a sudden it just shows up at my door the next day and it's one seamless. So that's really how it's operating now. And I don't think, um, as many consumers are aware of that yet, that that is, uh, it's, it's that powerful, frankly. Well, you know, and, and we're seeing um, stores are are actually adjusting the breakdown of real estate in the store with more space being allocated for the fulfillment of online orders out of that store. So it's becoming more like a, a micro DC within the store. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's going to be more and more shift to those kinds of uh, opportunities and channels for Walmart. You know, and of course they're experimenting with other stuff. Uh, certainly here in Bentonville and Northwest Arkansas, they're experimenting with uh, helicopter drones and airplane drones and how else can we get product to the people who live within just a few miles of this store. Um, so yeah, I mean, lots of opportunity, again, going back to that asset base of four, you know, four, more than 4,000 stores across the U.S. How do we, how do we make the most of all those stores and the proximity that they have to, to people everywhere? And what about the other trends, Jeff, in the space, but maybe related to mostly, you know, let's talk about like CPG products, right? Um, anything else that they need to be uh, aware of or anything else that, uh, you know, maybe what's on the horizon for, for that category or those categories? Uh, you touched on grocery. That is the, a key area for Walmart. There's a lot of velocity and investment there. A lot of innovation that Walmart's trying to drive uh, through, through the grocery channel. And at the same time, I mean, general merchandise when you're like, Hey, I need to get, I need a new lawnmower and I'm not, and I, and I don't want to order that online. I just need to get out and cut the grass today. I'm picking random examples, I guess, but, um, you know, that, but they have the whole store right there. If you're, if you're talking most, in most cases, a super center today. Um, and so to be able to go get a lawnmower within a couple of hours, um, that's, uh, while you're also picking up your eggs and milk, that's pretty powerful. In terms of innovation for those brands, I think it's going to be around advertising. Uh, there may be opportunities for Luminate data, certainly with the larger suppliers who have resource to get it to, to dedicate to the subscription and to the analysis of certain data that can come from Luminate. That will be uh, an opportunity for probably for larger brands, at least for the foreseeable future. You know, but for the most part, in so many brands, it's just going to be about uh, going all the way back in our conversation, just filling orders. I, we heard a Walmart executive, uh, you know, it was a couple of years ago, they said, if we made more omni-channel data available to you, we don't know what you would do any differently. We just need you to get the product to our DC when we ask for it. <laughs> and so, you know, because of the, <laughs> like, so, you know, the, at the end of the day, it's, it's complicated and it's simple. Um, and I think if brands continue to focus on the really kind of unsexy work of the consistent supply chain, that's going to be their biggest opportunity for success. No, oh, man, I, it rings true to my ears too, again, yeah. quitting it to Amazon, but it's just like, hey, it's, we want to do this new, you know, we want to make sure we have a brand story up or take advantage of the new, uh, you know, targeting we could do with consumers. Like you just need to be in stock. Like we just right. need to have a consistent right. you know, level of inventory there because if you run out, it's like stopping that freight train yeah. uh, of, of yeah. the Amazon flywheel. So you yeah, totally get yeah. it. Yeah. It's a simple stuff for sure. And as we kind of wrap up here, Jeff, I, Give me an idea of like of what a brand needs to do to, to kind of think like Walmart. Again, I, I think again, according to the Amazon thing, but I think if, if someone read Amazon's, you know, core values or leadership principles, like or the exact phrase they use for them, you know, they always talked about customer sub obsession and customer kind of first, right? And if if you kind of take the lens of Amazon's policies and programs, it does start to make sense when you put them through the lens of those. Is there anything like like, you know, a, a branch do to think like Walmart or put their Walmart hat on? And, and maybe they can see it through a different lens. W what are some of those core tenants or core values, you want to call it, that Walmart has that really are, are most important to them that brands should know about? Probably one of the first and, and maybe the biggest ones to be thinking about is 
at its core, Walmart really has built its brand on uh, what they would abbreviate to EDLC, EDLP, and that just stands for everyday low cost, everyday low price. And so they they are really wanting all of their suppliers to bring them the the best price, which they will in turn pass on to their uh, to their consumer. Um, and that will serve as their best marketing is just for, for shoppers to really trust that there's not a high low, there's not, you know, all kinds of jumping around on prices. If we can consistently deliver trust that our price is the best in the market, that will market our business that will bring people into the stores or to our website. Um, I, you know, I, I think that is a core tenant for Walmart to your point in the question. Um, with some of these entrepreneurial endeavors, uh, Luminate and, and some of the other initiatives that we've talked about today. It, it certainly affects the cost model to suppliers. And so that creates a more complicated, maybe nuanced conversation there uh, where, you know, suppliers that we talk with all the time are saying, hey, we appreciate, we want to be partnering with you to give you the best cost. But, you know, if every six to 12 months, there's something else that's adding one, two, three percent to my cost, like, I, you know, at some point, this really doesn't look like a, a clean PML as we've expected from Walmart for decades. This starts to look like a much more complicated, uh, you know, again, involved sort of cost model. And so thinking like Walmart, that is a core tenant. And at the same time, it's going through a little bit of a journey right now. I think suppliers are going to have to be a lot sort of sharper about how that plays out. For sure. I think also one of the great uh, reads is um, just business reads in general is, is Sam Walton's uh, autobiography is fascinating for number of rank, you know, number of amazing success story, obviously, but also, I mean, he's been gone for quite some time now, but I mean, it's, it just gives you and I even reading that, you know, the last I think I read that in the last five years or so, it really puts you in the shoes of of Walmart's philosophies, right? Of of, you know, providing value to the customer and having it price be that leading that leading indicator kind of thing. So um yeah, that's a that's a great great read if, if no one's read that one. Uh what is it? Uh it's a made, made in America. What's the, uh, what's the name of that? Made, made in America. That's yeah. was gonna be my guess. So <laughs> made in America. Sam Walton, yeah. So, Jeff, what are some other um, uh, resources that, that maybe brands could utilize, with a book being one maybe, but like some resources maybe you guys have or, or this maybe industry-type resources that you recommend to, to help stay on top of, particularly Walmart? Yeah, I mean, we we do provide a lot of resources on our website. It's right at the top of uh, ethanwalton.com, uh, resources at the top of the page there. Um, a, lot of, a lot of just free, good content. We've got a blog with new content all the time. Uh, covering a lot of the topics we've talked about and and in greater depth and uh, <laughs> sort of detail. We have a podcast there where we're talking about in new initiatives, best practices with suppliers, and then downloads. Uh, we have a calendar. Walmart runs on a, a fiscal year that begins in February, and then they number their weeks accordingly. And then there's other dates, you know, when are their warehouses closed and just other particular dates that suppliers need to know. So we have a download of a calendar that is specifically about Walmart's calendar weeks and, and dates. Um, glossary of all, like you said, the uh, alphabet soup, all of those acronyms. Um, so we have a glossary that covers all of those just for suppliers to know, just to give you a couple of examples. But yeah, all, all out there for suppliers who are curious. It's good to have that kind of stuff out there and great for people to check out. So and then where else can people find you, Jeff? Obviously you mentioned the website, but where can people find you? You know, live here in Bentonville um, and uh, love being a part of the community <laughs> of the town. Um, our, our company website yeah. is uh, 8 com, and that's with the number 8. TH and Walton. Um, that's the intersection where the home office has been for many years. Um, kind of the, it will become an Easter egg as Walmart uh, continues to build out a new uh, campus and corporate headquarters, but we're going to keep the name because it's, it's very well established in this uh, niche space, like you said. So um, yeah. And then I get out to a lot of the, the trade shows for all the different categories of the store. So if anybody wants to catch up at one of those in the next uh, six to 12 months, I'll be doing a lot of traveling. And Jeff Clapper, if, if you want to look me up on LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jeff. Uh, a wealth of information, all things Walmart. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure at some point, uh, as, we, as everyone rolls out new initiatives, we want to have you back at some point. But thank you so much for all the information. Glad to do it. Always great to always great to visit with you, Ryan. Thank you. All right. Thanks again to Jeff Clapper from Nathan Walton for coming on today and just instilling all that Walmart knowledge in us. I feel like I could talk to Jeff for hours and hours about everything and, and detailing it, all those particular programs and the the you know, the little, little minute details of each one, but I always have the time for that, but hopefully you found great value in that. And again, if you're looking for help in that area, please connect with Jeff and, and grab some of those free resources on their site. That's kind of amazing. They have the little things out there for brands to use. 
Uh, and if you're getting value for this this podcast and this episode, we would love for you to just help us out. Hit that subscribe button if you're watching this on YouTube or that subscribe button in your podcast player. And and please rate and review us. You know, we, we obviously, as you hear from every single podcast or video you watch, that's how these things work is that uh, we need your help in, in helping feed the algorithm, show that you're getting value from this content to help share with other people and let other people know about this episode if you think they would find value from it as well. So please, again, rate, review us, subscribe. We can't appreciate that enough. Thank you very much. And we'll see you next time on the Expert CPG Commerce Podcast.